Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. I'm your host, Seishu, and I'm excited to speak with Jared Platt, who's a, a Lightroom guru, a wedding photographer based out of Arizona, and he's, not, he's definitely made a name for himself in the Lightroom coaching circles. I mean, he is amazing in terms of what he's been able to do in the last few years. I've followed his work. He's now teaching a webinar through Shoot.Edit, and you know, I wanted to chat with him about his background first a little bit and then go into a little bit more detail about what he may be bringing to us through this webinar. Jared, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, let's jump, jump right into it, Jared. I know you're a, web, you're a wedding photographer and, uh, you know, you've, you've certainly made a name for yourself in Lightroom with using Lightroom and teaching Lightroom techniques. Uh, what is it that drew you to Lightroom versus any other type of editing software? Well, um, I initially started into digital right as a, at, at the turn of the digital era. So I was helping a studio that I was the, I was the studio manager for a studio back in 2000, um, 2000, 2001, something like that. And that was about the turn at which digital started becoming a, an actual viable thing. Um, at the time, it was mostly the only the only thing you could use was a digital back to like a Hasselblad. Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing a lot of scan backs and stuff like that. And then there were you know some of the the leading edge people were using you know the Nikon uh, D1X and things like that. And that's what I purchased was a Nikon D1X. That was my first digital camera. And uh, boy, that was a horrible camera. It was horrible. Um, it just magenta all over the place, weird greens. It just wasn't a very good camera. And so, um, I mean, it, it was an icon, so it had a great body and it had good lenses and stuff, but it just wasn't a good chip. Um, but at the time, there was nothing that could, I wouldn't, I've never shot a JPEG in my life. Um, anytime I've purchased a, a digital camera, it's always, even a point and shoot, it's always had raw because I just refused to shoot an inferior file. And so I was shooting raw. And so there was nothing. Photoshop didn't recognize a raw at the time. Bridge didn't recognize a raw. That You couldn't look at a raw image except with the camera's uh, resident program. So I, at the time, I was using Nikon's resident program, whatever that's called, the image capture or something like that. And uh, that was a horrible program. And so I... I spent, I would shoot a wedding and then I would go to, to work on the wedding and I would, I'd have to, I would look at all the images, I would choose my images because I could see raw images in a program called um, uh, Media, iView Media Pro. I remember that one, right. So I, I could see them in that but I couldn't adjust them so I would use that program to find the images and right. then once I had done that I would organize them into this shot's a little bit too blue. This shot's a little too blue plus needs a stop positive on exposure. This shot is too blue but needs negative exposure. And so I'd put them into folders with those names. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then I would have to go into the Nikon software and I'd say, okay, now this folder, I want you to increase by one stop and increase the temperature by, you know, X number of Kelvins. Wow. And then, and then I would send it to work. But it could only do one thing at a time, and so then I would have to, <laughs> I would have to send that. And, and I had a bed in my at the time I had my studio in my house, and so I had a bed in that room, and so I would I would set the program to working on exporting that set of photos on that folder, maybe ten or so, yeah. and then I would take a twenty minute nap, <laughs> and then I'd wake up. I had a little alarm and I like an egg timer. I wake up. And then I'd set the next folder and I'd go back to sleep. And then I'd wake up and go back to sleep and wake up. And it took me, it would take me all night long of like little 20 minute cat naps oh my to goodness. get this job exported. It was horrible. Wow. It was the worst experience ever. <laughs> um, so, when so, Light, then, so when Lightroom came around, you were just like, were you well, seeing Lightroom, praises or, uh, right away? Or well, what happened was um, I. At, at one point, Bridge started seeing raw photos and Photoshop started to adjust, to adjust raw photos. And so I started doing that, but it was still a very slow workflow. And so 
And then Apple came out with theirs, with Aperture. And I, and I was, at the time I was teaching college and I was so excited. I was like, this is going to change the way we, you know, do workflow. And it was a horrible program. In fact, it was so bad that Apple's, uh, Apple would take it back. It was a $600 program. And I walked back the day after I bought it and said, this is so horrible. And I handed it to them and said, take it back. And they said, the guy, the guy at the Apple store said, We've been told anybody who wants to bring this back, we have to take it back. Oh, wow. So Apple knew how bad the program was. But they released it, I think, prematurely because Adobe was coming out with something. Gotcha. And Adobe came out with their, their flagship, Lightroom, and it was, it was a beta. And their beta was so good... And it literally, when the when you there was a public beta, you open up the beta and it says, "Do not use this on any photos that are real. Like, just test it, just play with it, but don't use it on your professional work." Right. 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 And and I was like, well, "I'm gonna use it." So I started playing with it, and I just make a duplicate of everything before I worked in it in sure. Lightroom, and I never lost a file and never never damaged anything. And it was so good for my workflow that I abandoned all other programs and went directly into Lightroom at the at the public beta phase. Wow. That's where I that's where I went into Lightroom one. Right. And I've never looked back. So I've been there since the very, very, very beginning. You know, so. it's a, it's amazing to hear that you you've been an early adopter of Lightroom and I think that's one of the uh one of the benefits I would almost say of of learning so much about the program and and being able to tweak it the way you want to tweak it because you know all its nuances, all its you know all its uh, you know weaknesses and you know and and its strengths. Um, when you get to teaching, when you get to teach Lightroom as you have uh, in the recent years, uh, because that's what you do as well, right? You teach right. Lightroom. Um, what what is the one challenge you find among students, uh, even approaching Lightroom? I mean, want to want to learn to use Lightroom. What is the first thing that they they are sort of reluctant to do uh, that you feel you can quickly, you know, help them through with? Well, I think I think the easiest thing to fix is mindset. Um, a lot of people enter into photo editing and into Lightroom and into certain programs with a a bias towards something else. So they used to do it this way, and so and no one ever told them they were supposed to do it that way, but they used to do it this way, and so by tradition alone, right. they decide that that's the way they should do something. And so then they go into another program, and they try and get that program to act like something else. You know, it's like they used to ride, you know, a horse, and so then when they buy an airplane, they try and get the airplane to act like a horse. Right. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Just right. Just use the airplane as an airplane. Exactly. And if you want to go back to the horse occasionally for fun, do it, but don't expect the airplane to act like a horse. Gotcha. And so if, if, you can, if you can take people's mindset and change their mindset and help them to understand the purpose of the program and how it's best used and give them permission to kind of let go of their old traditions, um, that's, that's usually the most aha moment that people have when they realize, oh, wow, I can just... I can throw away the old traditions and start something new, right. and here's the best path, best pathway to do it. I think once people see something in the right organizational and pathway, you know, they see that that clear path. Right. Then, then it's easy for them to to let go of the old ideas and 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 do something new. So, uh, those are the times where people take the they take that little nugget of of information and that's when they really excel and so it's it's usually not like a keystroke or a or a specific you know uh, menu item that's so mind-blowing to them usually it's the process or the thoughts behind what we're doing um, that's usually what does it so if that's I usually try and stick to that and the other thing is that Sometimes people aren't using Lightroom, they're using something else. And so I try, even when I'm lecturing about Lightroom, to stick to the concepts and the ideas behind what we're doing so that people, even if they're not using Lightroom, they still get a lot out of the lecture because they can say, oh, well, I, I am using Aperture, but this concept could work. Sure. It's just I don't have as good a tool to do that concept. Right. So. Um 
you know, it's interesting that you, you've you've mentioned that you're, you're teaching you're, you're teaching about Lightroom, and you're all set now to, uh, you know, conduct a webinar on January fourteenth for Shoot Dot Edit. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about uh, during that webinar. Is it, is there something you can t- give us a sort of a hint at about what you'll be bringing? Well, the the webinar is specifically about saving time. It's it's basically time saving tips and keystrokes. Um, when when Jared from Shoot.edit approached me about doing that workshop, he said, you know, there's a lot of people who are using Lightroom that just, they don't know all of the cool keystrokes. Because the, the funny thing about Lightroom is it's almost like a, <clears throat> that there's no definitive set of, of uh, keystrokes that comes with it. You know, it's not like you get an, uh, you don't get a big PDF that says, here's all of the different keystrokes. They have a help menu that has like the best keystrokes, sure. but they're really not the best keystrokes. They're actually some of the most lame keystrokes. And then you've got to go like on the internet and find people's random, people just find them. Yeah. It's kind of like going to In-N-Out Burger and you don't know how to order the animal style burger or whatever and it's like a secret. And so I, I don't know if that's maybe a cultish mentality or something like it's just fun <laughs> yeah. to make people discover your presets or, I mean your uh, your uh, keystrokes, keystrokes but right. but so we're going to talk a lot about different keystrokes that I use and things that are useful and you know speed up the process like for instance um, one of the things that I'll show on in the uh, <clears throat> in the webinar is a series of keystrokes because I use a keystroke replicator the keystroke replicator is uh, is basically a uh, it's like a gaming console. Oh, okay, yeah. And and you can use any any gaming console will work for it. You just treat Lightroom as a game and tell it I want this key to do X and I want this key to do Y or whatever. And uh, one of the keystrokes that I use most often inside of Lightroom is a series of keystrokes that allows me to take a series of six images and throw them up in the survey mode and then if I click a button it dismisses those six and pulls the next six up. Oh wow. But it's a series of keystrokes. Okay. So like for instance the uh, command R key then will uh, dismiss all of the other selections and only select the one that's selected or uh, inside of the grid module the arrow key does uh, if you if you do a command arrow, it does something then different than if you do a shift arrow. It does something then different if you just do the arrow, and that does something different than if you do up and down arrows. And so those arrows, when put together, if you tell the if you tell a keyboard replicator to do some uh, a string, right, then you can tell it, okay, I want you to deselect all the current selected images, move to the next image in the line, right. and then add five more to that selection and throw them into the survey mode and then it will right. it'll do it and no. and it matters it matters what uh, organization you put them in too because if you do it if you try and do all that in the survey mode it 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 uh, it can do it but it runs slowly because the survey mode is doing lots of movement mm-hmm. so like the if you if you look at a set of images in the survey mode and, you, and, and you've got one image up in the survey mode and then you shift click to a, another set of images down in the film strip, it shows a bunch of motion. So like the, the one image is selected kind of shifts and moves over to the left top right, or the left hand side right. and all the other ones kind of appear in. So it's really kind of nice looking, mm-hmm. but that takes up a lot of your video memory. Gotcha. gotcha. And so if you start doing that kind of tricky stuff inside of the survey mode, all that motion slows everything down because the video memory is being sucked up. Yeah. And so instead what you want to do is you first want to if you want to if you want to program this you first have to hit the G key to move to the grid. Cuz in the grid mode it's not trying to do any kind of tricky video stuff. And so you can get things done faster in the grid. So you have to move to the grid, then you have to deselect all of your six, reselect the next six, then you have to go back to the survey mode and it shows them up. But it happens really fast if you go in that order. But if you change the order and you leave out the grid and you just do it in the survey mode, you think, oh, well, I'm not spending time going to the grid and back. Right. But you're actually spending a lot of your, your horsepower inside of your computer because 
the survey mode uses the video memory. Excellent. So, so it, little tricks like that will help to speed up workflow. And then now I can just push a button and it literally will change from one set of images to the next set of images. So when I'm selecting images, I just look at this six, then I look at that six, right. then I look at the next six. Gotcha. Now, do you, all of that you just said, uh, you know, clearly is something that you've customized, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's a series. It's a string of of keystrokes that I've created because that's I want I want to see six images and six images. And Lightroom didn't have a button that I could push that said show me the next set of images. Gotcha. gotcha. So I had to make it. Gotcha. But that's that's the beauty of Lightroom is that it's it's customizable enough gotcha. wow. through keystrokes and other things. You know, like for instance, uh, you've probably heard of um, RPG keys. Yes. Okay. So they have figured out how to really reach inside the guts of Lightroom and command it to do things. Right. So it's it's customizable enough and commandable enough that you can do that with RPG keys or you can do it with, I, I use also a, uh, it's called the Shuttle Pro 2. Right. I've so the Shuttle, Shuttle Pro 2 is a really beautiful uh, and it's really you know nice to put your hand on. It feels nice. It's ergonomic. And, and that has the ability to work. And RPG Keys is now working on uh, customizing the Shuttle Pro 2 and, or anything. So they're, they're getting to the point where their software will be able to work with a lot of different tools, not just with key, the keys that they sell. Gotcha. And so um, it's customizable enough that you can, you can do a lot to it and make it your own. Indeed. Um, there's there's some things that are not customizable about Lightroom, which has been a kind of a sore spot amongst a lot of people, because they kind of want it to be more like Photoshop, where they can move the panels around and they can do things like that. But what Lightroom, I think what their intention was is to force people into the correct path. And there is really, when you're dealing with mass images and you're trying to select and whittle down and adjust masses of mass amounts of images, there really is a better path. A lot of people say, well, there's, you know, all roads lead to Rome. They don't. Some roads lead into like horrible, you know, areas in New York City where you get mugged or whatever you know like so, some roads go to the wrong place absolutely and other roads go to Rome absolutely and so this is very cool. leads to Rome indeed so. indeed um, Jared thank you so much for giving us a little bit of a, of a peek into what is coming in the webinar on January 14th uh, shoot.edit is sponsoring and hosting this uh, webinar and uh, I will have a button uh, underneath this video where people can actually go and register for it. Um, if people have questions about uh, using Lightroom, would, would it be all right for them to post some of those questions below uh, this video so that they can, that you could jump in and answer some of those quick ones quickly? Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, and then if there's any, you know, I, I get a lot of questions via, you know, Twitter or, uh, so people can find me on Twitter at Jared Platt, so just pound Jared Platt, um, and, or at Jared Platt, I guess is how you do it, not pound. <laughs> um, I guess you could do a hashtag for me, but, um, and then on Facebook, people find me there, same thing, just Jared Platt, and uh, ask questions there too, and I, I have a hard time getting to them because I get a lot of questions, and so usually I use those questions to either make videos or I sure. use them to, you know, know what I'm going to lecture on next. Or, for instance, I'll be on uh, Creative Live in January and then again at Photoshop Week in February and then again in April. Uh, we'll have another big Lightroom class coming up. So oh, Wonderful. That's great. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of places to find me and get some education that way. I'll okay. be at WPPI as well as uh, at Imaging USA. So, well, that's, it's, it's fascinating and, and exciting to hear of all your, your teaching opportunities that are coming up. So we'll be sure to link to those as well in this post. So thanks, thanks for joining cool. us today, Jared. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.